Thanksgiving and they're spending time with family and uh, traveling and those sorts of things. So let's be in prayer for our uh, other church members. But um, aren't you happy to be here? Well, let's and and we should be especially happy that we have some early uh, guests, not guests, I guess, but re- returnees, brother uh, brother Hudson and Miss H are back, and uh, I knew that they were going to be back. I didn't tell anybody, so that's that, let it be a surprise. But anyway, we're just thankful they're here, brother Eric. You come and lead us in some worship. Well, let me invite you all to stand. We're going to start with uh, count your blessings. And if you want to use a hymnal, that's 563. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them. <laughs> Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journeys and Count your blessings, name them <clears throat> by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Have you ever actually tried that? Yeah. Counting them all? I, I always run out of patience after the first minute or two. But we could be there for a very long time. God is so good. So we're going to move on to give thanks with a grateful heart. <laughs> give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given us Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us and now let the weak say i am strong let the poor say i am rich because of what the lord has done for us give thanks give thanks give thanks amen 
I am giving thanks in my heart. I'm thankful to be here and thankful to see everybody who's come to church today. It's just good to be alive, you know it? Really good to be alive. It's still good to be an American. I'm glad I'm one. I'm glad I'm not living in Mexico or in China or even in Israel. I'm going to live there one of these days, but I'm going to wait a little while until the Lord fixes a picture. So it's just good to see you. I hope you thank God for every day. More and more, the older I am, I tell people, take nobody for granted. Take no blessing for granted. One day you could wake up in another spot and you'd be glad to be back where you were. The person that you take for granted could go to heaven or could leave this world very soon, very quickly. So don't take people for granted. Just love one another. Isn't that what the Bible says? We're about to receive an offering here. You know, we're still not receiving offering in the traditional way of passing the hat and our plate and doing all that. We're trying to still be very, very careful to uh, prevent any COVID spreading around in our church and therefore no touches and things of that and the distancing and all the things we're doing here. But we're still receiving an offering and we still have these uh, boxes at the back and at the side over here where you can drop your offering in and you can mail it in. And I want to just thank God. I want to thank you, the people of this church who love the Lord and love this church. And you've been sending your offerings in. You've been doing that. And in spite of these uh, almost a year now of COVID-19 issues, uh, still the giving of this church has been strong. Amen. Thank God. There's a lot of things. And by the way, it's all right to smile in church. It's all right to be happy, and it's all right to say amen and say it out loud. Listen to this. This is right out of the psalm. It's chapter 95, and these are the first six verses. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Did you hear that? A joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. And he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Oh, my Heavenly Father, what a beautiful passage and how it uh, strikes me. It makes me want to be more joyful and, and more thankful to you for the goodness you've shown. Lord, you've let me live all these years and have so many good years of serving you and having reasonably good health and all the benefits. And Lord, I've read in another one of these Psalms of yours that you daily load us with benefits, and so often we take them for granted. We don't even see them. But thank you, God, for all the benefits to me personally, for Margaret, my wife, and I ask that you will help me and every one of us to serve you well every day, not just on a goal line stand at church now and then, but every day we will give you our best I pray today that you will use Brother Darren. Just speak through him what we need to hear and give him liberty and give him substance and give him passion in his heart. And may we hear from you, hear from you today, O God of heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
let me invite you to stand again. And we're going to move on with number 262. Holy, holy, holy. I was looking for songs that expressed, expressed thankfulness. And this might not be on everyone's list, but I mean, this is just praising God for who he is. 262. our song service with This Is My Father's World, uh, number 58 if you're following in your hymnals. This is my Father's world, and to him a listening ears, all nature sings and This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hands the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world, oh let me never be seated. Okay, just making sure. Yes, I'm on. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> Peace of life. 
Well, good morning. You can say good morning. It's okay. Uh, I selfishly told Melissa to sing that song after I heard her practicing it yesterday. And I was right. Because, wow. 
What about that love that he has for us? Amen. Uh, I have to compose myself a little bit. That song's so good. <laughs> um, well, if you're like us, then you are officially on Thanksgiving break. That's where the Simpsons find ourselves this morning. Melissa is free from responsibility for school for a few days. Not enough days, but a few. Ben and John are out of school Having returned to school for a couple of weeks, praise Jesus, they've been out of my hair. <laughs> and I get to tackle them this week with Melissa beside me. Sedona's even out of school, but she may have some makeup work to do. And we are uh, spending our time this next week considering how and what we have to be thankful for. And we have so much. Amen. Amen. So much to be thankful for. Uh, Brother Lester said it this morning. We are still able to be thankful to be Americans. We really are. We're tremendously blessed to be citizens of this great country. But we have, I mean, I have a wonderful family. Three healthy, beautiful boys and, and sweet, happy Sedona. We ha I have a beautiful wife. I mean, come on now. My wife is gorgeous, and for some reason she loves me, uh, and I can't be any more blessed than to have her as my wife. Luckiest day besides the day I got saved is the day I, she said yes, and my, her, my in-laws said that was okay too. So I got my mother-in-law here today, uh, wonderful family, I got friends, I've got my health, God has blessed me with such great health that if I get any healthier, I'm going to have to find a tailor. Okay, to open these pants up a little bit. We have warm homes, comfy beds, every luxury we can imagine, endless access to information. We have a wonderful, loving church family who are faithful. We have God's provision. Even the most meager people who live in, the, in America live lives of luxury. We are so tremendously blessed, aren't we? And so this morning, I, when I was thinking about a Thanksgiving sermon, I wanted to try to grasp what is the thing we have to be most thankful for. What do we have to be most thankful for? Well, there only seemed to be one answer. And that is the great, amazing, and gracious love of our God. And there's so many examples of God's love in Scripture. I mean, there's many, but for some reason, the Lord attracted me to this strange story from maybe the strangest book in the Bible, Hosea. So let's read some of that story in Hosea. Turn in your Bibles, open your Bibles with me to the book of Hosea, and we're going to read some from chapters 1 and, and a little bit from chapter 3. We're going to hop around a little bit this morning. Uh, but we're going to try to get the gist of this story. Hosea chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 2. If you don't know where Hosea is, go to Daniel and just turn a page over. Okay? The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name uh, Lo Ruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by the bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, or by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bare another son. Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people and I will not be your God. And then John chapter 3, just verses 1 and 2, Then said the Lord unto me, 
Hosea speaking here, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the, Israel, to, toward the children of Israel, who look to the other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. Let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for in this time. Lord, we have so much, we, we often when we look around, we find so much to grumble about and complain about. But God, when we consider how blessed we are, and Lord, by how blessed we are by your love, your tremendous gracious love, God, help us to just celebrate. Help us to be thankful. Help us to, to draw close to this truth of how amazing your love is. God, as I... As we look at the story of Hosea in Gomer, Lord, help us to see your love uh, in this story. And Lord, help us to be, uh, to be uplifted and to be challenged. And Lord, we love you and we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. The story of Hosea and Gomer is unique. It's even a bit twisted. It's a salacious story about an extremely unlikely couple and an extremely unusual marriage. This is a marriage between a prophet and a prostitute. I mean, you read this story at length, you'll see that it overflows with heartbreak, failure, selfishness, despair. It's a story of broken vows, of broken trust, broken relationships, broken homes, broken hearts, and broken lives. The story is raw and real, as raw and as real as we see in the world around us today, but it's also a story filled with love, of hope, forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. The story has a dual focus. Yes, it's a story about an adulterous marriage between a husband and his wife, but it's also the story of an idolatrous marriage between God and his people. Hosea is unique. It really is. It might be one of the most amazing love stories ever told. But for us to get the full picture this morning, I'm going to try to give you some context from three different viewpoints. If we look at the book of Hosea from a distance, we'll see the historical landscape of Israel. This is during King Jeroboam II's uh, uh, reign when Israel was prosperous, but in their prosperity they were very unfaithful. And Hosea preaches sermons filled with judgment and hope for God's rebellious people. King Jeroboam II's military exploits had extended the, the borders of, of their nation the farthest since King Solomon's reign. Tribute monies pouring into the capital treasury at Samaria. And Israel is experiencing this unsurpassed period of prosperity, but also they're engaged in unbelievable idolatry. A little closer in, we see Hosea and Gomer and his family, which is like a living metaphor in this book. Hosea's love for his unfaithful wife reflects God's redemptive love for Israel. God saw Israel as his bride, and he viewed their worship of idols as spiritual idolatry. The first commandment that was given to Israel was what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But Israel persisted in idolatry, and they persisted in this uh, adulterous relationship with God. And by the time of Jeroboam the second the situation was pretty bad, really bad. God began to send dire warnings to Israel. He sent Amos, who thundered God's warning of imminent judgment. But they ignored Amos, so then he sent Hosea. And Hosea's name means Jehovah is salvation. But this morning I want us to see how when we really look up close to this story, We can see ourselves. 
We see how God's, or how Hosea's broken human relationship with Gomer reveals God's agony and brokenness at our sin. It shows the very heart of God. In Hosea, we can see who we are and how dearly loved we are. It's strange, but God has chosen this sad, sordid story of the broken-hearted prophet to take our breath away with his love. Hosea is our love story. I mean, think about the theme of Hosea. Even when you're undeserving and unworthy of his love, even after you have betrayed his love, God still pursues you. And he continues to love you. So, as we consider this gracious love that God has for us, and we consider how we can be thankful, how we can have a grateful heart, I I just want to take notice of three characteristics that I see in God's love, okay? So, here's, if you're looking for the outline, here it is. The first thing, the first characteristic we see is that God's love is extravagant. I'm trying to find adjectives worthy enough to to describe God's love and what we see in this relationship between him and Israel and between Hosea and Gomer, an extravagant just popped off the page for me. If we read from Hosea chapter 4, it says, Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to what's going on. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, no mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. And then if we go down to 4 verse 12, it says, My people ask counsel at their stocks. And their staff declares, their, their, their wood stick declares advice to them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. And then chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Ephraim, or Israel, is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walketh after the commandment. You know, Israel exploded with prosperity at this time. They were... They were experiencing tremendous wealth, but their their morality just collapsed. They had moral decay, spiritual degradation of every kind. They had words that are familiar to us, secularism and materialism. It had captured their heart. Sin was rampant. I mean, looks a lot like America today, doesn't it? We got moral bankruptcy, ethical decay, filthy mouths, slanderous tongues, lies, stealing, abuse of every possible kind, human sacrifice, even including killing their innocent children, prostitution, adultery, murder, rape, drunkenness, every perversion you can imagine. God was grieved by this sin, but he was most grieved by the sin of idolatry. And so God reveals his heart to Hosea, and he tells him, he commands him to enter into a love relationship with a prostitute. I mean, that's strange, isn't it? It's bizarre. I mean, Hosea is this upright man. He's a prophet of God. And he's supposed to enter into a marriage a covenant with someone who was completely unworthy, completely undeserving of his love. Someone who was, we would imagine to be gross, filthy. Hosea knew that this marriage would be one-sided and it would be heart-wrenching. But not only did God want to, Hosea to enter into marriage with this woman, he wanted him to love her. Not just to marry Gomer, 
but to love Gomer, knowing full well what she was, a prostitute, adulteress, and that his love would not be returned as he gave it. And this relationship is a picture of God's relationship with Israel at this time. Can you imagine this? I mean, have you ever found yourself loving someone deeply, fervently, and their love not being returned? I mean, how many stories do we know of of parents who've loved children who hated their parents, who rejected them, who used them and abused them and then left them? I've seen, I've seen the pain of parents who've gone through this. And that just tells me again that God's love is extravagant. Because he experiences the same pain in his own heart. You know, Hosea's experience reveals God's anguish and his agony over our sins. God's judgment, uh, justice requires judgment, but in his love, what did he do? He promised to redeem us. And he kept that promise to the end. God love us, loves us knowing that, he won't, that we won't love him back. I mean, God created us to love him, didn't he? To worship him, to, to live lives showing his glory. But he created us knowing that we would walk away from that. That is extravagant love. God's love is extravagant because the metaphor of this story is not that Gomer will love Hosea after he redeems her from her faithful, faithful, faithlessness. Gomer's love is not the point, is it? It's Hosea's love. Which means that our relationship about, with God is not about our great love for him. It's about his tremendous, extravagant love for us. Our very freedom shows the incredible power of God's love. God's love is a even though kind of love. What I mean by that is God, God loves us even though we might not love him. God loves us even though we repeatedly reject him. He loves us even though we put other gods before him. He loves us even though we commit spiritual adultery frequently. <laughs> God's love is extravagant. Amen. God's love always pursues us. He's chasing us. One of my favorite uh, Christ contemporary Christian songs was from the oh, late 90s by a guy named Andrew Peterson. He wrote a song called The Chasing Song. And he's singing about how how there's so many people in the Bible who are chasing after God, chasing after God's own heart. And, and, the, and the author of the song says, but all I seem to be chasing is myself. But in the, God's word we see God chasing us. He's chasing after us. When I wanted to marry Melissa, I had to do just some chasing. The very first time we met, and I had an opportunity Oh, she's closing her eyes. She doesn't want to hear the story. She, they, they visited our church. <coughs> Excuse me. And she was sitting on the back row. And I noticed her uh, a little bit into the music service. And I saw this, oh my gosh, this redhead man. And I went, I got to know who that girl is. I didn't listen to one word of that sermon. I was just kind of trying to figure out what I was going to say. Whenever that service was over, how I was going to introduce myself to this beautiful redhead and I walked back there she was sitting on the back row and I put my hand out and said hey really nice to see you this morning my name is Darren and she didn't look at me looked down and walked away yeah probably a good move yeah but I chased her I found out where they were going to lunch and I made it so I was there and I chased her God chases us his love is extravagant because he relentlessly pursues us. He yearns to draw us back to him. 
So we see how God's love is extravagant. Next, we see how God's love is faithful. Look at the faithful and unfaithfulness of God's children. They turn their backs on him and worship worthless idols practically as soon as they're out of Egypt. You remember after the Exodus, they get to Mount Sinai and things weren't going the way they thought and they decided, well, we'll go back to worship in idols. We had it better back in Egypt. And this is a habit that they continue throughout their history. We see it in the, uh, in the period of the kings, in the period of the judges. We see it in the divided kingdom. We see it in the prophets. We see it in the teachings of Jesus, even in, from the New Testament writers. They constantly practiced idolatry. But listen, we're, we're still worshiping idols in some ways today. We may not have an idol in our closet, a little uh, carved wooden figure, the altar of American freedom or the American dream. We'll worship at the altar of the Republican Party or some at the Democratic Party. Supreme Court rulings, even Donald Trump or other unworthy politicians thinking that they've got the answers to our problems. This world has been on a, on a campaign to remove God from every area of our country. They were, they've tried to remove prayer. They've removed the Ten Commandments from courthouses. They try to remove God from our pledges. The United States also worships at the altar of abortion. I saw a statistic that since 1973 through 2019, over 63 million abortions have been reported and they estimate that maybe 20 or 30 more million abortions have been unreported. That's like 80 million babies, isn't it? That's a generation of people, an entire generation of people that have been murdered by the worship and the thought that uh, my body belongs to myself and I don't need this tissue. Lest we forget Genesis chapter 1, that God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, male and female. And he blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply. And at the end, he said, what? He said, he saw all, everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But Eric read that for us this morning. But God's very good isn't good enough for America. We bow to every possible sexual perversion there is, and we seem to create new ones all the time. But here's the good news. <laughs> even when we're unfaithful, even when we have an idolatrous heart towards God, His love is always faithful to us. I... Love the passage from Romans chapter 8, right there at the end, verses 35 through 39. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or the sword? And then a, a couple of verses it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Savior. And we look at this verse or these verses from the perspective that these outward forces cannot separate us from the love of Christ. But even when we turn to these outward forces who are tr constantly trying to seduce us away from God, that cannot separate us from his love either. He is faithful. Even towards his often disappointing followers. Do you remember the disciples? Were they always faithful to him? I mean, when things got tough, what did they say? Oh, yeah, we'll go with you to the, uh, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll drink of whatever cup you're going to drink of, Lord. Peter said, no, I'll never deny you. That's impossible. I'll die for you, Jesus. Well, what happened? They couldn't take the heat. They couldn't bear the thought of their own death. 
and they ran. But Christ's love was faithful. And when he came back, what did he do? He pursued them, didn't he? God loves us even when his love is unreturned. Even when we flee from his obedience. So we see God's love is extravagant. God's love is faithful. And perhaps the last today is God's love is sacrificial. I mean, this is the story of Hosea. It's the story of the gospel. That God loves us sacrificially. Think about what's happening in Hosea 3. We read this just a moment ago. Here's this, this man of God who loves the Lord. And he lives a life above reproach. Think about the personal sacrifice that Hosea made. His reputation. His dignity. His integrity was sacrificed to marry a prostitute. Scripture says that she gave birth to three children. Probably only one of them was actually his. Can you imagine the sacrifice to continue loving this woman? To love those children? I mean, Gomer abandons her family to live a life of prostitution. She eventually leaves the scene. She lives a life of degradation in Hosea's commitment. His love, his sacrifice is shown in caring for three children, two of which probably weren't even his. He had to be mom and dad at the same time. And I'm going to tell you, that's tough sometimes. I've done it in very short pockets. But he did it all the time while he did his job of preaching. Doom, gloom, and judgment on Israel. Can you imagine the gossip that Hosea heard about him and his wife around town? Can you imagine what others thought of him and what he heard about that? Can you imagine how his children probably were mocked and mistreated by the other children or even by their other parents? And in Hosea chapter 3, God tells a Hosea to go redeem his wife. Buy her back. The story tells us that Gomer had fallen so far into sin and despair, she wasn't worth much. Hosea bought her back for half the price of a usual slave at that time. He had obeyed God and not only married Gomer, but he loved her. He genuinely loved her, sacrificially. Hosea lives another example of you choose who you love. Love is a choice, isn't it? And Jesus chose to love you and me, even though it cost him so much. Hosea went to get his wife back. He had to buy her back as a, from the slave block, and, his, and, and, and she wasn't worth much. Gomer was worthless to the world. But to Hosea, she was priceless. He is willing to sacrifice his reputation, his dignity, his money. We don't, it says, it gives us a price for how much he paid, but we don't know how much was in his bank. It could have been everything he had. But he was ready to give anything to restore her. You see the connection now to us? Believers are the bride of Christ, but many times we're unfaithful. What is grace? The title of my sermon is Gracious God, Grateful People. What is grace? Undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor. We don't deserve God's love. I mean, God created it for the, us for this purpose of worshiping and showing His, His glory, but mankind rejected this and and God, in His extravagant, faithful, sacrificial love, so loved us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
despite how ungrateful, how unworthy we are, despite how we often don't reciprocate his love. Think about what he gave up, what he sacrificed, his majesty. He took on the form of a servant. He sacrificed his heavenly existence, which had to be pretty nice. For what? Our dirty, filthy, painful world. And then what did he do? The ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life, his body, his blood on the cross. He paid the price. And it wasn't like the price Hosea paid for Gomer, which wasn't very much. It was steep, the highest price, so that he could redeem us. The story of Hosea is the story of the gospel. Now tell me this morning, what do you have most to be thankful for? What a gracious God we have. We have every reason, the supreme reason (laughs) this morning, to be a grateful people. Thankful for his love. That he was that he's given to us extravagantly. And he does not withhold from us, giving it to us faithfully, and ultimately demonstrate it sacrificially. This message has been mainly to remind us of how amazing God's love is and how thankful we should be. But God's love demands a response, doesn't it? Maybe you're here today and you've never heard the love of God described like this. Many think that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and judgment, but clearly he's the same God, uh, Genesis to Revelation. Yes, absolutely anchored to his character, which includes his righteousness and his holiness and his sovereignty, but also his deep, extravagant, faithful, sacrificial love for a whole world of sinners. Perhaps the greatest verse, the most universally known verse is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're here and you've never heard the love of God described like this, let me tell you, it's real. And he showed it for real on the cross. And the reality is, is that all of us face eternity. We face eternal judgment without the love of Christ, but... The only way to be redeemed is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Putting your full faith and trust in Him. And you can do that today. Maybe you're here and you remember this church, professing believer, and you saw, hopefully, how God's love is extravagant towards us. God's response, God's desire, His vision is that we should join Him in showing His extravagant love to this world. We're to to love our enemies. God loves His enemies. We were counted among them at one point, weren't we? His love is different than the the world's love. That's the whole point. Or maybe you saw this morning how God's love is faithful. You see, this prophet Hosea put his love, put God's love on display. Loving someone who who wouldn't love him back. You know, the church is supposed to do the same thing. There's plenty outside these walls who do not love us back. And we can find plenty of reasons to complain and and to slander and to and to minimalize who they are and to just cast them aside. 
Christ would have never done that. And we're never to do that. We're to love them despite how much they may hate us faithfully. We're to love with God's own love. And maybe you heard how God's love is sacrificial. Well, the gospel isn't just for us alone, is it? It's not just for the people in here on Sunday morning. It's for everyone. I mean, as soon as we grasp its meaning for ourselves and we put our faith and trust in him, we're called to live it out in front of the world around us and to share it, not to hide it, not to keep it to ourselves, not to keep it secret. We're supposed to share it. God's love demands a response. How will you respond today? Let's stand together. It's the greatest love story ever told, isn't it? And I can't help but get excited about it because I'm part of it. And we should be thankful (laughs) that he's including us in his love story. Let's respond how God would have us to respond today. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful. Lord, this is a strange story we looked at today. and I hope it's clear from this story what we see about your love. How tremendous, how extravagant, how gracious, how faithful you are to us. Lord, I'm astonished at your faithfulness. And Lord, ultimately, how sacrificial your love is. Lord, help us to be grateful. Lord, in this time of Thanksgiving, I I know many are going to travel and we pray for safe travels. But Lord, we often are wrapped up in being thankful for the trappings of this temporary world. But Lord, help us to embrace how thankful we are for your son, for your love, and for uh, how you've changed each of us. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray you just bless our afternoon. Be with our afternoon service. And, and Lord, we ask last, if anybody else is, anybody is here who's never heard this story, or never fully understood it, and needs to learn more, help them not to, sac- to, to, um, to hesitate to ask. Lord, help us to be ready and faithful to share. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And Lord, we praise you for all that you are in Christ's name. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Two o'clock, we'll come. And a, and a short, probably shorter sermon from Psalms 23. So thank you so much. You're dismissed. Good day and God bless.